everybody. I think we're going to get started. Um, we're Talaria Press. My name is Kiana Kirkland. I'm the editor-in-chief, and I'll be moderating this panel today. And we're going to start out doing a little bit of the history of publishing and then start with how to uh, publish your own works, starting from the writing process all the way through to the publishing process and marketing. So uh, I'll begin with publishing. Talaria Press is a small indie press located here in Seattle. It was created by the four of us for the purposes of engaging with new media and presenting books in a way that people find accessible and interesting to them now, as opposed to traditional media, which sometimes will provide media in the way they want to provide it to the reader, as opposed to how the reader would like it. With me today are the other the other founders of Talaria Press. Do you guys want to introduce yourself? I would love to. Uh, hi, I'm Ren Cummins, uh, also author, creative director, um, which I think is just a flashy way of saying, hey, I have an idea, let's do something. Uh, I've written a few books, um, six novels, and a co-author or ghostwriter on about 40 other projects, just, you know, out there, um, and a CD, so I can't, I can't um, focus, I guess. Um, <laughs> and that's me. Hi, I'm Angel Reesby. Uh, I am the author of three novels uh, with more in, on the way. Um, I'm also the PR director, which basically means I just really like to talk to people. <laughs> so, um, I'm we're just really excited to be here, and I'd like to introduce my husband. Hi, I'm Garth Reesby. Uh, no fancy HL or GR. Um, <laughs> uh, I have one book out, I'm the newbie. Uh, Although I, I have a short story in our uh, Founders Anthology that we did uh, for Emerald City Comic Con this year. Um, I guess uh, I, I'm the least experienced as far as the writing aspect goes, but uh, I'm the art director and I've done a few book covers and things like that. So uh, I pretty much get to say, hey, that's cool looking, let's use that. Or, uh, uh, you know, no, we don't want that right now, but will you draw us this? So. I like how we distill our titles out of the most humorous analogy we can. Like, hey, let's do this, and oh, that would be cool. I like talking to people. That's the nice way of distilling it. Well, let's not be pretentious here. We are still new kids on the block. Not new kids on the block. No, no. I'm, um, I'm the funky bunch. What is it you're singing, guys? So, <laughs> one of the things that you want to think about when you look into publishing and the publishing methodologies in the past is creative control. It used to be that when you would go with a traditional publisher, you would basically lose creative control of your project. Um, you'd sign over essentially all your rights. If they said, oh, you should kill this character, then you killed the character or you lost your contract. Um, one of the things that we think is really important for Talaria Press is that creators have control of their own product. Um, like Image Comics, we don't want anybody signing away the rights to everything that they write. We don't want people uh, losing control of what they created, their babies. Um, we take it really seriously. We believe in collaborative editing, uh, which we could talk a little bit more about under the editorial process. But essentially what it is, is your editor is there to go with you and guide you into better writing as opposed to take over your project and make changes that they feel are appropriate. So, uh, did you want to talk about Patton Oswalt? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was devouring the internet about a week ago. Um, and I found this great uh, keynote speech that Patton Oswalt, the comedian, gave at a, a comedy festival uh, about three or four weeks ago. And uh, he started out by describing these two letters that he had written to two different groups of people. One were, was a letter to comedians. And the letter was, you know, hey, we need to be aware that everything has changed. He said, when I wanted to be a comedian growing up, he said, you knew when you'd arrived as a comedian, because you went on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, you did your five minutes, he laughed, he waved you over to the couch, you sat down, and the next morning you had people pitching you ideas for your new TV show. That's how you knew you arrived. Then one day, Johnny Carson left The Tonight Show, and nobody ever replaced him. And so there isn't that same kind of sense of, now you've arrived as a comedian. So he says, what are you going to do? How are you going to know you've arrived? He said, well, thanks to things like YouTube, thanks to things like the internet, you can make your own path to whatever level of success you want to achieve. 
the key is you got to take it seriously. You got to do something with it. Um, it as, uh, as as Chris Hardwick, the nerdist, likes to say, as nerds, we're given this wonderful gift of laser-like focus. Our brains are lasers, and that's why we're so good at our nerdist hobbies because we love everything. We devour everything Doctor Who or or Firefly or Buffy the Vampire Slayer or whatever it is we love. We just devour it. We know everything about it. We know. Okay, for example, Garth, who played Boba Fett in the first original Star Wars? Jeremy Bolt. Yes. <laughs> and only, only true nerds with that devotion to that, that laser brain can know or, or care about details like that. But it's that same laser-like focus that lets us do anything we want to do. So our curse is our gift. The second letter he wrote was to the people who were in charge of the movies, the TVs, and everything else, and saying... Your days as creative gatekeeper for all that is supposed to be of quality is going away. Because now if people want to watch their own show, you can watch The Guild for free on YouTube. You can watch The Geek and Sundry channel. You can watch The Nerdist channel. You can watch whatever you want to watch for free on something that's on a TV set. You don't have to go to a movie theater. You can watch it at home. You can read a blog that you like very much. You can read an e-book by an author you like very much. I'm going to talk about that afterwards. Um, there's every avenue to get the creative entertainment that you want, and you don't have to go through the old channels to get there. You can go right to the people who did it, or you can be the people who do it. So the world's changing, and every day it's a new model for getting what you want to have done, done, or finding what you want to enjoy. And it's, it's a great opportunity, but it's also kind of scary because it's not the same as it was two days ago or five days ago or a year ago. It's not the same as it was yesterday. And that's kind of what our focus has always been, is, is to say there's a brave new world out there, not like the book, but like, like the actual theory. And we want to be small enough to be mobile enough to adjust for all those changes as they come down. And individual authors need to think about that, too. You need to be able to change. You need to be able to adapt your own work and, and not get kind of married to the idea like, well, everybody always does trilogies, so I need to do a trilogy. You don't need to do a trilogy. There's no rule that says that you have to have three books, and three books are better than two, or two books are better than <laughs> one, or any of those rules. Those are all out the window now. Um, and one of the things that we're really committed to is bringing people things in the format that is best for the creator and the best for the reader. Why do people do books in fives? Why does it always have to be like three or six or or like George R. R. in 25? Um, or Robert Jordan. Talk about that guy. 13 books and he doesn't even finish. Oh, anyway, sorry. Um, well, he he kind of died before he finished it, so that's kind of a problem. Yeah. That's a good I think that's why they're doing three. Right? That's a they pretty can good excuse. They can live through that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, everybody can write notes to the people who will posthumously publish the final book of all their series so that you can keep creative control of that. Always a good idea. That's a good idea. Bring it um, down. What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on the book, I promise. It's the like other... these totally outlandish notes for people to go off of after you die, so... What, what is he talking about? That could be fun. I write mine in pidgin Spanish. Great for us. So... The other thing that is an advantage of uh, indie press like ours, and that we've found is really important, is you don't have to sit and wait around for someone else to take control. Like Patton Oswalt was saying, you don't have to wait to try and get on to a late night show and then get that nod. When you're a writer, you can bypass you know, getting stuck in the slush pile and cold calling agents and all of those things. You can continue to do those, and maybe you, I would say you should. Um, but you also have the option now as a writer to bypass, you know, gatekeepers to power and, and be your own power. And that's really important to us. And, and here's the thing also. The, the, the publishers and such cast themselves as gatekeepers, but they're still just human. Uh, with regard to my book particularly, I got great responses, but they were always all, well, we don't know what to do with this. We don't know what category to put it in. Is it superhero? Is it, is it fantasy? So we're just not going to even try. What, what's your book genre? Contemporary fantasy. Superhero, god. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's contemporary fantasy with an Egyptian twist. Which then on the shelf for it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Someday.
<laughs> get really popular, like the paranormal teen romance section. That could be you guys. That could be, yeah. Mine, mine, mine <laughs> is. I didn't say vampires in the book, though. I'm in trouble. I know, right? I it either. could be modern uh, superhero spy thriller. Mm. Which they also don't have. Any. With some vampires. I'll throw some vampires in there. Just, just, just <laughs> for us. Only if they're sexy. Sexy. Sparkles. Sexy vampires. No sparkles. No okay. sparkles. <laughs> no sparkles. <laughs> Extra sparkles. I, Go I, your own way. I got the same responses. I, mine, mine's a young adult steampunk fantasy series. It's basically a Victorian Buffy the Vampire Slayer with no sparkly vampires. Um, it, it's a 12-year-old who, who is the embodiment of death and has to kill monsters. Um, my daughter helped inspire it. She's the one over here hiding her face in shame. Um, <laughs> but her complaint, her complaint was like, we didn't see the Harry Potter movies, and she was like, well, why do you, why is it Harry Potter? Why isn't Hermione Granger? Because she's doing everything. His whole thing is, he didn't die. That's it. He didn't die. That's his superpower. Oh, you can fly really well on a broomstick. But she's like, she does all the research. She does all the work. She does all the, the powerful magic. She does the, the, the potions. Everything. It's not Hermione Granger and the Deathly Hallows. That's wrong. And so um, she wanted to read a book about a girl who kicked butt and who liked to wear pretty dresses. So that was it. But they don't have like a young adult steampunk fantasy monster thing section at Barnes Noble either. Scott yeah. Asterfeld's working on it. it I, he is, he is. <laughs> thank, thank God. Um, but it's still a, a very small section. So that's kind of the part of the thing. Is we, wanna, we, we don't have to worry about that. When you go to Amazon, you don't have to look by sections. You say, I want a book like this. And they'll go, well, then you probably like this also. It's a whole new frontier for finding books and marketing it.